So, we've been on this tour, and now you can have a seat. We've been on this tour, and hopefully you all will, will bear with me. I'm going to try my best to get through this. Nehemiah, really, really for the last 24 hours, uh, we have had some time together that, have, that has been amazing, the last 24 hours, in our, our hotel and just sharing and the situation with his father and a number of other things. But one of the things that Nehemiah did do is he said that we were going to be going out and teaching people about the name of God. We were going to be storming the prisons. And I will tell you something. I, I, I felt like I was in a position where it felt sort of aggressive. But I've realized something. Sometimes our father gets aggressive. So I want to give you a simple picture. And I actually sent this picture to my wife, and she got a little bit nervous because she's a Montessori lady. You know, in the Montessori, everything is kind of, you know, how you feel and, and how it is. But I sent her this picture. I said, honey, I want you to know as I'm out on tour with Nehemiah, this is how I'm feeling, and this is the picture. <laughs> that is my Israeli tank or my chariot from heaven. Can I get an amen? Why do I show you that picture? Because when I got to here, to New Mexico, something else happened. And it happened today. Uh, I guess what I'm going to try to do to, to the best of my ability is I'm going to try to explain this uh, the best that I can. Um, what happened was this. On Friday, well, let me just back up a little bit. When Michael told me about coming to New Mexico, he made a statement. He said, hey, we're going to go to New Mexico, but we've got to make the decisions now because there's this festival that's taking place in New Mexico. It's called the New Mexico Fiesta. Somebody knows what it is here. If you know what it is, just raise your hand. It's this really big deal. People come from all the world, all over the world, to go up in these things, little wicker baskets, with this really light material and fire. Not such a good idea, in my opinion. However, I wanted to understand more about this, so on Friday, I did a really radical thing. On Friday, I got up in the morning, and I have a Facebook friend. Facebook is amazing. Sometimes it works. I have a Facebook friend from this region who happened to, as we were going to Los Lunas, I was in Los Lunas, and this thing has been on my mind since Michael told me. On my mind, what's it about these balloons? What's it about these balloons? We're at Los Lunas, and my Facebook friend, Carol Coffin, where are you, Carol? Just stand up real quick. Come on, real quick. St give her a big hand. You're going to be real happy about her. She hears about the invitation to Los Lunas, and she does what I wish more people would do. She invited her family, all four of her daughters. And her daughters came to Los Lunas, and I'm sitting there, and we're talking about everything that's there. But this can't, this doesn't get out of my mind. And I know that when the father's doing something with me, he will not let me rest until I do it. Can I get an amen on that? So I'm there at Los Lunas. I'm asking everyone, what do you know about balloons? What do you know about balloons? All of a sudden, I ask her daughters, what do you know about balloons? And one of them says, well, I happen to be uh, up on the chase crew of one of the best balloons in New Mexico. And I said, really? And we're talking. I said, tell me about the balloons, back and forth, back and forth. She says, my uncle is the best pilot in all the world. His name is Stephen Coffing, Steve Coffing, And you know what? He's the best. I say, could I talk to him? Is there any way? I know he's really busy. 700, say seven. 700 balloons are here this weekend. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I believe that the Father has me doing this. It's so important that I'm going to get a chance to actually talk to this guy at the busiest weekend of not only the year, but it is the 40th year anniversary of people going up with wicker baskets and very light material and fire. So Friday morning, I get in the car with Carol, and we go travel to chase the balloon. We're trying to find out where the balloon is. Sure enough, we get there. The balloon is down. It's in the trunk. It's in the trunk. Everything's done. And finally, I get a chance to talk to this man. And he has this balloon. And I want to show you a picture right now of him. I am there Friday morning with him. And that's as close as I want to get to one of them balloons. Can I get an amen? <laughs> His name is Steve Coffing, And I'm asking him some really technical questions. Then he tells me my balloon is called the twist of fate. And I'm thinking, really, tell me about that. He tells me about the balloon that's called the twist of fate. And I want to show you what happens to be on the statement of his balloon. Twist of fate was named for the unusual chain of events, chance encounters, and occurrences that brought us into the sport of ballooning. This is a picture of his balloon, 90,000 cubic feet. In other words, if you take 90,000 basketballs 
and put them inside of his balloon, that is how big his balloon is. So on Friday, they tell me, you know, we've got sponsors and people, and, you know, we take people up here and there. And I'm thinking, okay, no problem. Saturday comes. We go through Saturday, Shabbat. So last night, at the end of the night, I did a really radical thing. I had invited Carol, if they would be willing, to get me up early in the morning to help them at least prepare the balloon. You know, like fix it and stuff. There's like these crew of people. Have you, anyone ever done that in here? You, what you, you've been a part of the crew. What is it about you people here in New Mexico? <laughs> he has like 20, 25 people there for only one reason, to help prepare the balloon to go up in the air and when it comes down, to break it down. So I said to my friend Nehemiah, I said, Nehemiah, you won't believe it. I've got a Facebook friend. And Nehemiah perks up because he loves Facebook. My Facebook friend has a brother-in-law who owns a balloon, and they will let us learn about the balloon because there's something really powerful about the balloon for the people not only here in this ministry, but throughout the world. We've got to go help with the balloon. He says, okay, well, what time are we leaving? I said, 4.30 in the morning. He said, l'chat <laughs> Whenever Nehemiah is really, really serious, he speaks in Hebrew. That means good luck. <laughs> So last night I go to sleep and I did this really radical thing, you guys. I prayed. I said, Father, what I am preparing to share is kind of a big deal. I will go so far as to say this. What I have been preparing to prepare to prepare is a kind of big deal. And I've asked him if I could get out of it. And so I did a radical thing last night. I said, I'll tell you what, Father. It's the 40th anniversary of the balloon fiesta. I found a man who has a sponsor, who's got a balloon. I've met the man. He's going to have 25 people there that he's going to choose. Put me on the balloon, and I'll share it. Please, Father, don't put me on the balloon. <laughs> We get at 4.30 in the morning to the place, the fiesta, 100,000 people are there, Michael's sleeping, Arthur's sleeping, everybody's sleeping, somebody say, Nehemiah's sleeping. <laughs> but because I've got this thing on the inside, I cannot sleep. I should have called you, Michael, and asked you to be in my stead this morning. They pick me up. They take me to the festival. They got all of the tags and all the badges. And I mean, I'm riding in the lead car with the trailer. And we just go right through into the festival. And you step out. And there's thousands and thousands of people in the middle of the night. And Steve says to me, I'm going to do a special thing. I'm going to let you go to the pilots meeting. I'm like, oh, I'm really getting close now. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Steve says, I'm going to pick three or four people to go to the pilots meeting with me. So I go to the pilots meeting, y'all. I love pilots. I love the technical thing. Uh, the weather will be at uh, 200 feet. <laughs> uh, 400 to 2, the 6421. <laughs> uh, we expect the wind at the, uh, 300 feet. <laughs> and we would also, uh, and they go on and on, and I'm just happy and happy. And I'm saying, I can't wait to tell Nehemiah that I got to go to the pilots meeting. <laughs> And then as we were on our way back, they started to unroll 90,000 cubic feet of a balloon. And as they unroll it, everybody, get your gloves. I get my gloves, and I'm doing everything. And then we got to go get to leave. We do this, and we do that, and we do this. And, we open it. and Steve looks at me, and he says, you know, I'm in the first wave of the mass ascension. Now, I forgot to tell you one little thing about Steve. They told him that I was a pastor. Oh, I'm so glad I'm Methodist. Steve said to me at the pilot's meeting, Keith, do me a favor, at the end of the pilot's meeting, you just make sure you elbow me because they have a circle of prayer at the end. Make sure you elbow me. I got a job now. Somebody say job. job. It's my job to elbow the pilot and remind him there's a circle of prayer. And he says, literally, elbow me to remind me. And I'm hoping when I remind you, we will go to the circle of prayer. And sure enough, at the end, we're looking. We can't find it. And then all of a sudden, a circle begins to form. He says, it's over here. I said, okay. We went and prayed. And in the end, the chaplain, and I don't know what denomination he came from, he simply said this, and we pray, Father, in your name. At that point, I'm like, well, I know I'm going up on the balloon. <laughs> he could have said, in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. 
that's what we're supposed to do. He should have ended the prayer like any old good old-fashioned chaplain, just like I used to do day after day, week after week, at the Super Bowl, at the Olympics, in the locker room. You always pray in Jesus' name. Now, y'all going to get quiet on me, but if you get mad, get mad at God. This man ends the prayer and says, and so, Father, we pray in your name. And I'm thinking, this man's going to let me get on this balloon. <laughs> we go back. He looks around, and there's 25 people waiting to see who he's going to pick. And he says, Keith, you will be one. I get in the twist of fate. <laughs> there are 700 balloons with about 20,000 people hoping they'll get picked. And they put me in the twist of fate balloon, and I was lifted off the ground. Here's a picture, lest you think I'm lying. I am in the twist of fate. And we are up in this thing, and you all, it is the most awesome feeling you could ever imagine. I do not like heights, but I love being lifted up when there's wind that is, hello, somebody. So I'm up up there, and there are all these balloons. They're everywhere, you all. If you've ever seen it, it's amazing. They're just lifting and lifting and lifting and lifting. And I'm up there, and then Steve, who happens to be one of the best pilots, at least in New Mexico, maybe in the world, according to the coughing family, we get up so high, he says, we're 7,000 feet above sea level. Somebody say seven. How many balloons? And then he does a radical thing. Because at this point, I'm thinking, OK, this was good. Let's get back down. <laughs> we get up in this balloon, and he shows me this. I want to show you the picture now. I am there, and I am over the Rio Grande River. And he says to his people that are on the floor, these people that chase the balloons, you know they're balloon chasers. Uh, considering doing a uh, splash and dash. I don't know what that is. I'm taking pictures saying, oh, Nehemi, you should have woke up at 4 in the morning. Now, uh, hold off on the uh, check. We're going to do splash and uh, dash. I said, uh, Steve, what is a splash and dash? Show me the picture again. The picture is me up in the balloon, and Steve says, what we're going to do if we're able, but since there's so many balloons, it could be a bit dangerous. What I want to do is I want to go from 7,000 feet down into the Rio Grande, and I want to touch the water and lift back up. I said, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and he says, it don't matter what you say, because I'm the pilot. Splash and dash. <laughs> and we began to descend to the Rio Grande the first time. But there was another balloon that decided to do it at the same time, and he said, abort. I thought, good, we're not going to do it. Uh, we're going to try again, the splash and dash. <laughs> he let the winds take him back again, because I don't know if y'all know it or not. There are only two things that a balloon pilot controls, going up and coming down. Everything else is in the hand of my father. <laughs> And guess what I was doing at that point? <laughs> we went back this way. He said, the wind's going to take us here. Now, we might drop a little bit. And then we did the box. You know, there's a box, you know, that goes up and down. Y'all don't know about that, but I know because I've, I'm a professional now. <laughs> and we go by the Rio Grande. Now, I'm going to do something that is not popular. I want to take you on the balloon with me. Technologically, I'm not even sure it's going to work. It's going to, you're going to hear a sound, and it's important about the sound you hear. The sound you're going to hear is, I'm going to actually take you live, not live, we've got it on the bottom of the Rio Grande. <laughs> Can I show you for just a minute what it was like to be in the twist of fate this morning as one of 700 balloons that decided to do the splash and dash? Here it is right here. He cut in on us. the ground. 
And we're going to touch the top of these trees. Someone else has decided they wanted to cut in on us. Slashing and dashing, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Touching trees, get into the river. Somebody say river. Are you kidding? We have been all the way to the top. Now we are on our way down into the water. This is where we're going to land. Guy's a pro. <laughs> this guy. We brought our balloon down to the river, touched the water, and now Mr. Coughing is saying it's time to go back up. Wave by, say hi to the crowd. That's how you do splash and dash when you're on <laughs> Steve Coughing's balloon, the twist of fate. And Mr. Trees ahead of us. I tell you what, you all, I'm not even going to talk about this because, well, you know what, I have to talk about it. I want to go to this. Why am I going to show you this? I want to show you something that was actually written by a very important person because there's two things that happened with the balloon. One, I had an awesome, amazing time. I am thankful to Steve Coffin. I am thankful to Carol. I am thankful to Gabrielle and everybody, Joan, that worked this whole thing out. I had an amazing time. We tried to land four times. You, hey, Bob, hey, but that's between me and him. <laughs> First time, abort. Second time, power lines. Third time, another balloon. Fourth time, we're going to land. We land. And I'm thinking about something really interesting. How does this situation with these balloons, what is it that God was doing with me about these balloons that I would just have this in my spirit and he taught me something this morning that is happening amongst people all over the world? There's a negative side of ballooning. And let me tell you what it is. When you take off, you are at the mercy of the winds. That can be a spiritual thing. And that can be a problem. And what I found is there are too many people that are simply being blown by the winds more than being grounded in the word of God. When we did this project, one of the things that I said was this. And I'm going to tell you something that happened, you all. Nehemiah, I want to say something to you today. Now that you're finally at a place where you're willing to give all the information and all the inspiration on the name of God, a prayer has been answered for me. Because to have this man as a Hebrew scholar stand up before you and give you this information, because I know what most people say, that's just a Methodist. But guess where I got it? From him. And now he's saying, after he's finally been converted, to my way of thinking, <laughs> yes, Keith, we must teach about the name. Yeah, Nehemi, I've been saying that for a while. <laughs> but here's something that happened. We did this project, and when I was invited to teach this, I went to the leaders, the heads of this particular station, because I was very concerned, like Nehemi said. And I said, listen, um, I'm sending out this study around to people around the world. I actually sent it to 500 people around the world, including the leader, one of the leaders uh, of se several leaders from several different places. Well, I got a bunch of responses back. Andrew Hodkins and people from around the world responded and told me things. One of the responses I want to share with you right here, and this is not tooting my own shofar. I just want to share you this information. It says, after I started, his hallowed name revealed again, I couldn't put it down. I replay the CD, I wake up hearing the names, I love it. Everyone needs to read it. I'm like you, I get so excited just knowing these scriptures, then looking them up in Hebrew and wondering why on earth they ever got away from proclaiming his name. It's so healing, so empowering. Now I'm going to show you something that will be considered controversial. This is one of my study partners, Tommy Cooper, God's Learning Channel. A woman who not only had this incorporated in her life can give testimony of how the name of God in its original language 
History and context can bring healing. However, something happened. When I shared this information, there were winds of change that came in. I bring Ephesians 4.14 for you for this reason. It says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Scheming. Why do I bring that? Not because of Tommy. I bring it because there's too many people like us that will jump on board on something and never really, really, really check it for ourselves. Can I say it again? Never really check it for ourselves. So one of the things that Nehemiah and I have made a commitment to do, everything we write, everything we say, every time we're on radio, television, wherever it is, we want to always bring the source so that you say you. Come on, y'all. Can check it for yourself so that you don't become the negative side of ballooning. You go up, the winds come, you go right. You go down, the winds come, you go left. Every wind of doctrine, and you know, maybe not people in New Mexico because you understand it, but other parts of the world, there are too many people that are just like the negative side of ballooning. All you control is going up and going down, and you are being tossed. You are brought left and you are brought right, and you are just like those balloons being talked and turned around by every wind of doctrine. Now, why is that the issue before I share with you the issue? I'm about to share some information with you that has not been shared. I'm going to give you some information that most people haven't seen. In fact, I'm going to say something, Nehemia, as I was sitting here listening to you. I'm going to do a really radical thing. I'm going to take what we've learned in the Tanakh, and here it comes, and apply it to the New Testament. Thank you, this side. <laughs> These are the Torah people. These are the New Testament people. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could take the information and the inspiration from the Tanakh, which we got first, and apply it into the New Testament. Now, I'm about to have a huge deal on my back for what I'm going to share. So here's what we decided to do. I'm first going to remind you of something. Go to the next slide, if you would. You have heard Nehemiah talk about this. He's done presentations over and over again. But I have not usually talked about it, and I'm going to tell you why. I have loved the fact that my Jewish brother, who is not a Christian and is not a Messianic, teaches you about the origins of the name Yeshua. I am excited that Nehemiah Gordon is teaching you about the origins of the name Yeshua. Yeah. Yeah. Nehemiah didn't start it. I didn't start it. Michael didn't start it. An evangelical named George Howard started this. This book is available, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. If you open this book and you go to the particular section, here's the manuscript. If you go back to that picture... This is the manuscript that George Howard is looking at. He's looking at this manuscript, those particular words, and then he's doing the translation. Now, if I look at the particular words there, it says here in English, uh, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He puts Jesus in here because he's an evangelical and he doesn't want to get in too much trouble. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus because he will save my people from their sins. Now, if I do what I've learned to do, I look at that English that George has here and then I go over, if I can, over to 21 in Hebrew. And then I see, you shall call his name Yeshua for he, Yoshia, who, Yoshia, Yeshua, Yoshia. You guys have already heard about this. You understand that the name Yeshua is a very important name to some people on this side of the room. <laughs> but on this side of the room, you want to know, well, where did the name Yeshua come from? And you understand that the name Yeshua came from the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. It wasn't something that was created 
from the folks on this side of the room. It was created by those who understood the name Yeshua, meaning the original name, which was Yehoshua. Now, why is this important? I'm going to do something here. I guess I should. Ah, should I do this? I don't know. I don't know if I really want to do this, but I think I will because you already brought the whole issue of the, uh, the Aramaic. I'm just going to show you the Aramaic example of the same verse, Hebrew and Aramaic. She will give birth to a son. You shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save Yoshia. Nehemiah talked about this. What does the Aramaic say, which is the official Messianic Bible? It says this, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will keep alive Nahiyu, his people from their sins. The name is supposed to be connected in Aramaic. It is not connected. Check it for yourself. What I want to do today is this. I want to talk to you about the name Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey in Hebrew, Matthew. Anyone care about that? <laughs> this side, do you care about that? All y'all want to know is about Yeshua, right? Okay. Very interesting thing happened. After we got done with Shavuot, I did a radical thing. I spent about 30 days in prayer and fasting in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Why did I do that? Because Nehemiah said that we were going to go out and share with people. And I know there are a lot of people that are saying, Keith, okay, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? So I did something. I did an in-depth study on the name in the New Testament. After I did an in-depth study on the name in the New Testament, I honed it down, honed it down, honed it down, and honed it down simply to the Gospel of Matthew. Why did I do that? Because I knew that if I had the witness in the New Testament of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew and everything I've learned about the Tanakh, it's possible that there could be some revelation in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew about the name of his heavenly father. Amen? This is what I found. Well, I guess I should tell well, you know what? Don't show the slide. I guess I should do something. Well, maybe I should go back. Show the slide. The name yod heh in Hebrew, 19 times. Is it in the King James Version? Does anyone see yod heh in the King James Version? The NIV? The NASB? Nowhere? In Hebrew Matthew, it is 19 times. Nine, say nine. Nine, nine times in the mouth, this side, of Yeshua. Man, oh man, I mean, I thought people were really going to be excited about this. <laughs> that Yeshua, nine times in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, proclaims the name in Hebrew. That side. But there's something more radical. Here's what we decided. Before I get to the nine times that Yeshua shares it, can I share something even more radical? It actually shows up a whole lot more times than that. In fact, before Yeshua was born, an angel proclaimed the name of his heavenly father. Now, you might not understand what I'm saying, so what I want to do is go back. I want to talk to the Methodists for a minute. You understand that the name Jesus is an English word, right? But you know that the name Jesus is not the actual original name of the one whom we call Yeshua. And of course, this side realizes that even Yeshua, which is his name that was given, is based on another name. You all know that. Just go like this. You all know that. Okay. I want to show you an example of something in your English Bibles that's a little bit confusing. The name Jesus actually is based on the English name Joshua. Did you all know that? Okay, good. Now, if you don't know that, I'm going to give you the short version because Michael's going to tell me when I'm done. So to make this quick, what I'm going to do, if anyone is listening, in the back of this book, I do an entire section about what about the name Jesus. And what I do is a linguistic uh, opportunity for you to check to see it for yourself. But I want to bring one example that's really, really significant. Open your Bibles, if you would, if you have your New Testaments, to Acts chapter 7, verse 45. Acts verse 7, verse 45, you will find this which also our fathers, and here it is, that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers onto the days of David. I bet you nobody here has this translation where it says that. I bet you nobody here has this translation. If you had my grandmother's Bible, she has an older version of the King James Bible. Her older version of the King James Bible says, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. It actually says Jesus. Now, is her Bible wrong? 
you, you, you guys aren't with me. Okay, keep it up here. Here's what yours probably says, Joshua, right? Am I right? It says Joshua. Why does it say Joshua? Because Jesus is the example. It is the, it is the word that they use. If they really were going to be consistent, they would have used the English word Joshua. What you ought to see over and over again if they were consistent is when Jesus wanted the temple and when Jesus did this, you would actually say when Joshua did it. But they don't want you to do it this side because otherwise you'll be more like this side. You'll start thinking if they say the name Joshua, that must mean that name means something. And you might not want to just focus on Jesus. You might want to find out what the name is behind it. And when you find out about the name behind it, we know that Joshua absolutely represents the name of our heavenly father. All right, that's not a good example. Let's go to another one. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. Go up on the screen. Here's what it says in my grandmother's Bible. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now, the updated English versions are saying that old King James is confusing people. The people are so confused they might realize that Joshua's name in English is the same as Jesus' name in English, which come from the same original name, which you'd find Joshua, son of Nun, in Hebrew, which would be Yehoshua. And you guys already know what that means. I don't need to bore you. But Hebrews 4.8 instead says this, for if Joshua. Y'all got that? Okay, excellent. Now let's move on to the fun part. Let's go to here. Yeshua. Say Yeshua. Yeshua. Come on, side. Say Yeshua. Yeshua. That is the name that we all love. Say Yeshua. Yeshua. Where did Yeshua come from? Yehoshua. Say Yehoshua. Yehoshua. And in English, this side say Joshua. Joshua. This isn't my opinion. You can check it for yourself. And where did that come from? This is actually where it gets a little bit interesting and where I would guess that you're probably going to get a little bit nervous, maybe not on this side, but certainly on this side and many of the Methodists that are watching online. Yehoshua means Yehovah Yoshia. That is two different words connected. That is what Yehoshua means. And what would be the translation of that? It means Yehovah saves. Now do you all understand why it's significant that the angel gave Yeshua that name? Now here's what we decided to do being the researchers that we are. We thought it would not be good enough just to show this information to you, so we decided to do something really, really radical. We took the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, we took the English Gospel of Matthew, and we took the Greek Matthew, and we decided to look and see how many times the name of our Creator who saves is in the Greek, in the New Testament. Here's what we found. The NASB, 151 times in Matthew. In the Greek that Paul wrote, 152 times. Now, there's a difference. The Greek, 152. The NASB, 151. Now, wait a minute. What did the NASB do? At some point, the NASB decided as they're looking at the Greek, we're not going to add that one time where it says Jesus. So they only went to 151 times. The King James Bible has Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew 172 times. What is the King James looking at? We've got the Greek, the official Greek that has 151. The King James has 172. Let's give a hand to the King James. (laughs) Go back to the slide. The NIV, the nearly inspired version, I will now tell you my secret that I've never told anyone before. The reason I call them the nearly inspired version is they're getting real close to the amount of times that Jesus is actually mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. 212 times Jesus is in the Gospel of Matthew in the nearly inspired version. Okay. But let's get radical. Y'all don't care about Jesus. Say Yeshua. Yeshua. And y'all don't even care, but say Yehovah. Let's take a look in the translations that actually use Yeshua. The first one I want to go to is the Aramaic. Let's take a look at the Aramaic. The Aramaic uses Yeshua in the Gospel of Matthew 187 times. Let's give a hand to the Aramaic. Okay. Can I open up the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew? and let you see how many times Yeshua is in the Gospel of Matthew. 
217 times more than any English version. If you read the Hebrew Gospel, Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, you're going to say Yeshua over and over again. Now, here's what happened last night. I'm going to tell on my friend Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, you know, if you're really going to be official on this, we're going to need to count the amount of times that we find Yeshua in the Hebrew Bible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say Yeshua, and you're going to write it down. I like that. <laughs> Yeshua, Yeshua, Yesh lit box, you. Yeshua, Yeshua, five, Yeshua. And he's saying Yeshua, Yeshua. He's going Yeshua. Come on, somebody. Yeshua. <laughs> Ain't y'all excited about this? I mean, I'm the Methodist. I'm in the hotel room and the lit box saying, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. 20 times, Yeshua, Yeshua. I started feeling something. Yeshua, Yeshua. And he started feeling, Yeshua, Yeshua. And after that, Nehemiah said, that's enough. <laughs> he got up to 81 times. He said, we're going to do this different. <laughs> I mean, I got to stop and tell y'all something. I love this brother. Even he had to laugh. Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. <laughs> he said, oh, we're going to do a radical thing. We need to change some things. Let's take a look. We changed it differently, and we ended up finding 217 times Yeshua is in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> that means, that means that 270 times before we get to the 19 times, the name of our Heavenly Father is proclaimed in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Let's get to Yeshua. Say Yeshua. Yeshua. When Yeshua quotes scripture, he always has in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew two little symbols, a hey and an apostrophe. Why is there a hey and an apostrophe? This is the Jewish tradition of not writing yud, hey, vav, hey. So when I see the hey with the apostrophe, I know that represents the name of our heavenly Father. So when we find Yeshua doing this, here is what we find. Here's an example. He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But what we find in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is love, yud, hey, vav, hey, with all your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Let me actually show you. Here's another example. He said to him, love, yud, hey, vav, there's the hey. The hey is right there in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Instead of the four letters, you see two symbols. Say two. A hey with an apostrophe. Now, you guys, this is cutting edge what I'm about to share with you. Look at your neighbor. Touch him and say, are you still here? Come on, are you still here? Online, if there's somebody in the room with they say, are you still here? Just grab them and see if they still got a heartbeat because I'm about to share something with you. I'm about to share something with you. Here is the manuscript that actually will let you read exactly what I read, what I've learned from my friend Nehemiah, that when you come across this manuscript, which is from Breslau, which was kept by the Jews when Hitler took the Jews out and tried to, to cause them to be extinct, they had this manuscript in their midst. This manuscript, which was put into the Museum of the Extinct Race, which is no longer the Museum of the Extinct Race, because why? Hitler's extinct, and my Jewish brothers and sisters are still here. <laughs> Back to the manuscript. If I look at this manuscript, what I am going to see is I'm going to say, and you show love, and then I'm going to see a hey with an apostrophe, your God with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Anytime I see the hey with an apostrophe, it represents, somebody say you. Yes. Somebody say hey. hey. Somebody say va. Ah. Somebody say hey. hey. Do you all understand what I'm saying? If you do, just go like this. Okay. So what we find is this. Now, here's what's happened. I asked Nehemiah something really radical. I said, Nehemiah, I've got something I want to share with the Messianic, Christian, Methodist, Baptist, anyone that will listen, but it's a pretty radical topic. I need your help. What I had learned, I actually did an in-depth study on the nine manuscripts that we find in this book. He said in this book, eventually somebody will come along that will find other manuscripts. Who did God choose to find the other manuscripts? Nehemiah Gordon. Would you give him a hand? <laughs> Nehemiah lives in Israel. He comes from a traditional Jewish Orthodox background. He lives in a Jewish neighborhood in Israel. And as he was out walking the streets, as I asked him about this, I said, Nehemiah, I am considering bringing this forth to the community. Would you help me? He was out with his trusty camera, and this is what he found. 
Take a look. This is a synagogue in his neighborhood. You probably can't see it real well, but up at the very top, there is a hay with an apostrophe. Let's bring it a little bit closer. Here's what this says. Yehovah, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place in which it dwells, your glory. At the top, what the Jews have done is they said, listen now, we cannot write Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, but we know when we see the Hey in the apostrophe, somebody say two witnesses. We know that when we see the hay with the apostrophe, that is the name of the creator of the universe. Okay, so we've got the hay. We also find it in other places. Here's a picture of my Torah scroll. On my Torah scroll, if you know, it says, Ki mitzion totzah Torah v'dabar, hay mirushalayim. The hay represents yud, hay, vav. Hey, there is the tradition that says you will and shall not write Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. Let me tell you something really interesting. In these manuscripts, the Gospel of Matthew, that so many people say are not legitimate, they say that the person that actually did it had an agenda. Isn't it interesting that in the actual manuscripts, there is a respect and an honor for the name of God. Now, let me get really radical. When it came to the manuscripts that I'm about to share with you, they did not take out of the mouth of Yeshua, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. Second time that he quotes, when Yeshua introduces a quote from Scripture, he also, we find in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew this, have you not read concerning the resurrection of the dead that? And then he speaks yud heh vav heh, but it is a hey with an apostrophe. I'm saying it over again so that when you leave here, you understand what it is that I'm about to share with you. Hebrew Matthew 22, 31. There again is yud heh vav heh. So we've got three times. Now here's the part about Yom Teruah, Michael. I've been waiting for Yom Teruah. I've been waiting for this event for 30 days. I'm praying. I'm fasting, I'm reading, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm reading, I'm preparing to come to New Mexico for the weekend of Yom Shout. And guess what I find in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew? Yeshua is shouting. I knew he was a Methodist. He shouts in the Hebrew. Now, some of y'all are saying, uh-uh, no, we ain't going for that. He was a good old-fashioned Jew. Uh-uh, we'll let him be Jewish, but we ain't going to let him be Methodist. Ain't no way he was shouting. You and Arthur Bell, you and Arthur are only too excited about that. Arthur, would you I get an amen if we can find it? Yeshua was, Teruah! Amen. Hallelujah. Ain't nobody else excited, Arthur, but I am. Now, just before I show you the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, can I set a little context? Psalms 101 says this, for those of you on this side. Raise a shout, say shout. For the Lord, say the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all say Lord over here. Okay, back to y'all. All the earth. Now, if I were to look at that in the very Bible that Yeshua reads, it would say, raise a shout for Yehovah, all the earth. And the word for shout is the very root of the word Teruah. So that's Psalms 101. But here's what we find. And you guys, I'm going to try my best to calm down. My Methodist brothers have said, you ain't been talking much about Jesus. You ain't been talking about the New Testament. You've been hanging around with that Jew too much. So can I talk about the first words out of his mouth after the resurrection? Yes. Guess what it says in the King James Bible? It says this. Jesus met them saying, all hail. Okay, y'all over here on this side, y'all say all, say all. all. Say hail. hail. Say all. all. Say hail. hail. We can't do that because we're not King James Bible people. We're going to have to look and see what is the King James Bible saying here. You mean to tell me that the first words recorded out of Yeshua, whom they called Jesus, should have been Joshua, name Yehovah saves, was all hail? Who's he all hailing to? Is he hailing himself? Is he hailing the people? Is he hailing these alive? Why is he hailing? The King James Version says, we don't know. All we do is say, all hail. So what we want to do? Keep 
reading. Let's look at another version. Here's what it says in the NASB, my particular favorite English Bible. It says Jesus met them and greeted them. Uh-oh. The King James said he said something. The NASB says he just simply greeted them. The NASB people, they get nervous sometimes, especially if they're looking at stuff that don't right fit the way they want it to fit. Can I look at another version? The NIV. The NIV said, I think the NIV folks are from uh, Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> greetings. <laughs> Jesus met them saying, greetings. <laughs> now, if you believe that, y'all might want to leave for the next section. <laughs> I like the King James Bible. I think when he got up from the grave, and the first words out of his mouth that the King James Bible said, he shouted. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do something radical. Let's take a look at the Greek. Give me the Greek slide. If I open my Greek Bible, it will say, Jesus met them saying, Karete, rejoice. Does that sound a little better? Yeah. Maybe what was happening was the King James saw rejoice and said, you know what? If he was rejoicing, maybe he did a little bit more than we think. And so the King James probably took their liberty to say, hey, man, he just got up from the grave. Is there any excitement in here about the resurrection of Yeshua? Yeah. Yeshua said something. What did he say? In the Greek, it is rejoice. Now, here's what I want to do. I need to go to the, uh, let's see here. I want to go to uh, Hebrew from Greek. In other words, you're looking at the Greek. Here's what the Hebrew would be. Yeshua met them saying, shalom lachen, peace to you. That is what they're saying. This is based on the translation from Greek into Hebrew, 1877. Sounds good. Shalom lachen. Now, what I love is we have the Aramaic. Let's look at the Aramaic to see what the Aramaic experts say about the first words out of his mouth. Here's what we find. Yeshua met them saying, Shalom lechen. That sounds like the same thing that they would have done from Greek. To, is it possible that simply the Aramaic here is only doing the same thing you would do if you looked at Greek and is that possible? Since you guys are thinking about that and you've already spent your $59.99, let me show you something else that might convince you that it's possible what the Aramaic is really doing is looking at the Greek. You all know at the end of the prayer, the Our Father prayer, there's a doxology. You know about the doxology? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Just so you know, that does not show up in the earliest Greek manuscripts. This is me talking, so i tell you what I'm going to do. Let me show it to you. The doxology. For thine is the kingdom of the power and the glory. It does not show up in the earliest Greek manuscripts. Rather, what we do is if we go to the earliest Greek manuscripts, I have a copy of one here. If I go to this manuscript and I go to the end of the prayer, I find that at the end of the prayer, there is no doxology. That is the last word. You can check it for yourself. It doesn't exist. However, as I listen and as I read the Aramaic, which is the official version, the official Messianic Bible of the Aramaic version, it is exactly like the later Greek manuscripts. For I have even heard them say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If I open up the Hebrew, uh, the, uh, the Aramaic verse uh, uh, chapter uh, of the prayer. Why is that important that I'm bringing that to you? Because here's what we have. If we go to Hebrew Matthew, say Hebrew Matthew, 28.9, we find something really, really special. Now, before I share this with you, I have to tell you something. It is possible that what I'm going to share with you might cause you a little bit of discomfort. But remember, you were excited when you looked at the Hebrew Gospel Matthew and said we found Yeshua more times than any other English version. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I mean, well, you guys were excited, right? Woo. Yeshua met them saying, can I tell you what he said? No, if you guys want to know what he said based on the Hebrew, this side, would you just raise a hand? Okay, good. Doesn't matter about this side. <laughs> now, in order for me to tell you, I've got to give you just a little more history. Come on now, y'all. Now, yeah. I mean, is it good enough for me to just stand up here and tell you, don't you want to know for yourself? This is a picture of how we initially are able to get the information of the manuscripts. My friend Nehemiah Gordon, who stood before you, who's writing a book on the priestly benediction, when I called him, I said, Nehemiah, I've done text criticism on nine manuscripts from around the world. It is not going to be good enough unless you would be willing to go and check the other 
11 manuscripts. He said to me, I will stop what I'm doing. I will go into the basement. I will get behind the particular uh, uh, screen and see what the other 11 manuscripts say. When he did that, something happened. He called me on the phone with his regular voice. Woo! <laughs> Nehemiah checked these manuscripts and found something. Can I tell you where they came from before I share it with you? These are in libraries in Rome, Florence, Milan de Livy, Oxford and Cambridge, England. The Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, Leiden, Holland, Breslau, Poland, St. Petersburg, Russia, Jerusalem, Israel, and even in the Vatican. Nehemia calls me up and says, I have now completed the other issue that you wanted me to check. These are the libraries, you all. I want you to put the screen up again. These are the libraries and the places that today, because of technology and the fact that he has access to information of Hebrew manuscripts around the world, these are the places where the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew all say the same thing. Here's an example. I'm going to let you see it for yourself. The Breslau Manuscript that came from the very place where Hitler went in and took all of the artifacts from the Jews and put it in that museum. The Jews were keeping this manuscript in their community. You got to ask yourself why. The Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. If I take a little closer look, I find something. Now, I know you all, you, don't, you can't read that, but what that is, let me, let me back up. Let me back up. Let me back up. Yeshua died. Okay. After three days, he got up. <laughs> let me say it again. Yeshua died. Say died. After three days, he got up. One more time, Arthur. Yeshua was dead. <laughs> After three days, he got up. My last time. Somehow, some way, Yeshua got up from the grave. Can I make an assumption? Can I just make an assumption? I think he got up because daddy raised him. Read your Bibles. When we go to the Breslau manuscript, the first Words out of his mouth. In Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, he speaks something out of his mouth. All of the manuscripts say the same thing, and here it is on the screen so you can say, uh-uh. You can't say that. In the Breslau manuscript and all the other places, we see hey with an apostrophe. I appreciate y'all Jesus folks over here. I like y'all Yeshua folks over here, but you would think that this side could read Hebrew enough to see that that hey reminds them of yud, hey, ba, hey. And even though they ain't so good in Hebrew, they probably don't know the second word, but if they were really, really good Hebrew folks, they would know that the second word is all throughout the Tanakh. The second word is this, and a better thing, it is hey with an apostrophe, and guess what the next word is? Yo. Yeah, Ken. Yehovah. Yoshiach. Since you don't know what it means. Yehovah, Yoshiach. Yehovah saves you. Now back up. You got to wonder. 
wonder, you got to wonder for a minute while he was down there in the grave for three days. You got to wonder for a minute if he wasn't waiting for daddy. You got to wonder if he's thinking, is it going to be one day, two days, three days? Okay, he said three days, but then when it really came up to it, all of a sudden the Father in heaven said, it's time. It's time. Somebody say it's time. It's time for me to raise my son. And so what does he do? He goes down and he raises up Yeshua so that he can walk and he can talk. And when he sees the disciples, who happen to be women, you see, the smart aleck men, they're saying, uh-uh, I'm going to get him on this now. The men are saying, uh-uh, I ain't going for this now. Uh-uh. Women, let me tell you something. According to the Hebrew gospel of Matthew, when he saw the women, he said, I hope he saves you too. <laughs> Why would he say that? Read Psalms 55. Okay, y'all ain't hearing me. I tell you what, Psalms 55, 16 for this side. Here's what it says in Psalms 55. I need El Elohim. Not me. And what does that mean in English? As for me. Oh, I wish somebody would hear me right now. As for me, I will call upon God and Yehovah shall save me. Okay, that, 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 that's not good enough. Let's go to Hosea 13, 4. Y'all ain't with me. Hosea 13, yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Moshiach besides... Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 43, 11. Somebody's going to get here. Even I, even I, even I am Yud, hey, Bob, hey, and besides me, there is no Anohi, Anohi, Yehovah, the Ain, Mebal Adi, Moshia. God has decided that He is Savior. One more, one more, because you know what, I, Eric, have I gotten any kind of messages? Has anyone online said, I get it, I understand it, I understand where you're going? Here's what it says in Isaiah 49, 26. All flesh, including the Methodist. All flesh, including the Messianics. All flesh, including the Baptists, including the Jews, the Karaites, the Rabbinites. It doesn't matter. Somebody say, all flesh. Say it again. All flesh, which means you may not have known now, but he says, all flesh. Maybe you didn't know it last year, but you've been in the balloon, and you've been going about your business, and for some reason, you have decided to land in New Mexico for the Yom Teruah event, and there was an opening for you, and you have landed there, and knew you are a part of all flesh. What does it say? Come on back to it. All flesh shall know that I am Jehovah. Okay, no, 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 you guys don't get it. All flesh shall know that I am Yehovah Moshiach Begolech, the mighty one of Jacob. And then it says this, Yehovah Moshiach Begolech. I am, all flesh shall know this. Now you guys, Nehemiah said this. He said that when he went down to hell, he found the hounds of hell. Boy, I can hear them yelling right now. I gotta be somebody. Are there any hounds here today? Just go like this. Woo! Uh, there's that many of y'all in the room? <laughs> hey, you guys didn't hear what I said. If the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is even close to correct, that means that Yehovah is the one who raised Yeshua. And if Yehovah is the one who raised Yeshua, you wonder if Yeshua didn't also know Psalms 55. Yehovah Yoshi'eni. So that when he was raised from the dead, he had only one thing that he had to say first. And I guarantee you something, Michael. I guarantee you that if Yeshua were to walk in the back door right now, I guarantee you something. 
He would look at some of you in your place of death. He would look at some of you in your place of pain and struggle and darkness. And I am convinced, based on what we have learned, that he would still be proclaiming the same thing today. Yehovah, Yoshiechem. May you come into a place in your life where you will realize something. Everything he said I did was about him. And yet, what have we done? And I went to a seminary that taught me. I'm in a denomination that does it. You know what we've done? We've told God, you're just a little bit too big. You're a little bit too amazing. You're a little bit too Hebrew. We would just prefer to deal with the English Jesus. May it not be. Yehovah does not make mistakes. Everything Yehovah does means something. And if we could only get back to our Bibles in their original language, history, and context apart from Constantinian agenda, we would be shocked. We would find that the words of Yeshua are alive today. We would realize that when Yeshua is on the cross and he says, Eli, Eli, what is he talking about? My God, my God. And yet I find so many people with blank looks on my face saying, no, 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 because that would mean that God is the one I got to deal with. Let me tell you something. There will be a day when he will set up his kingdom and he will be one and his name shall be one. And here's where Nehemiah and I probably don't agree. I happen to think that God in his wisdom probably decided when he told the angel, why don't you go name this one me, my name? Let him carry my name so that when they think about him, they'll think about me. But you see, we mixed it up. When we think about him, we only think about him. And he says, don't you know I do the works of my father? I and Nehemiah, we probably disagree. I think it would be so cool once the father sets up his kingdom on the earth if he would have somebody named Yehoshua as the Mashiach. <laughs> amazing? Wouldn't it be funny? And some of y'all say, I just want to say Jesus. And he'd say, no, that's not my name. He'd say, you know what? If you're going to call me, call me by the name my daddy gave me so that when you called my name, you'd think about my father. <laughs> now for the end. Let me tell you what happened to me. When I did this study, I thought about you. I thought about the people that are listening. I thought about the great theologians. I thought about the pastors, the teachers, the bishops. And I thought them saying to themselves, no, 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 no. You see, there's a reason that the English translations don't want to see Yehovah Yoshiachim. Because then maybe you'll understand something. You'll understand that there's an agenda with religion. Let me tell you what I appreciate about Michael. You know what I appreciate about Michael? He's got chutzpah. <laughs> Michael won't tell you he knows everything, but what he knows, he'll tell you. And I just wish more people, once they know it, they would tell it. Now, I'm going to tell you something this morning. When I said to the father, if you'll put me on the balloon, I'll say it. And he took me on the balloon and he showed me so much, but he showed me something else. He said, you know, there's so many people that are filled with hot air. I wanted you to hear the video in the background where you hear <laughs> and that was Steve as we were going up they first filled that balloon 90,000 metric of feet with cold air kind of like the ruach come on somebody you know he blew into Adam into his nostrils the ruach but then when they want to raise the balloon, they got to add somebody say hot air. And when they raise the hot air, 
the balloon begins to go up like this. And there's so many of us that have been taught by people who are filled with hot air. And yet, we get filled with the hot air and we go with every wind of doctrine. I'm going to tell you what Nehemiah and I have decided to do. And Michael, thank you for letting us do it here. We're balloon chasers. <laughs> See, we're looking for those people that are saying this. I've had enough. Steve's got a red line on his, on his balloon. And when you pull the red line, guess what happens? Where's my shofar? He pulls the red line and the balloon starts to come down. Now, some of you here have pulled that thing so quick, you came down so quick, you crashed and burned. Seriously. And you're hurt and you're upset and you're mad at the church. And I understand that. Thank God you got rid of the hot air, but there's a way to bring that thing down. See, there are people like us that if you'll communicate with and say, I'm coming down, we'll chase you. Come on, somebody. You know this is a good message. We'll chase you if you live in Texas. We'll chase you if you live in New Mexico. We'll chase you if you live in Colorado. We'll chase you when we see you say, I'm coming down. And when you come down, you come down a little bit at a time. You say, you know what? I'm tired of the hot air. I'm tired of the winds. I'm, come on, somebody. I'm tired of the preachers. I'm tired of the rabbis. I'm tired of everybody that's got an agenda that simply wants me to go with their wind of doctrine. Let me tell you something. Oh, the reason that I'm bringing this to you is because I have seen it for myself. I'm looking for some people right now that are ready to land. Oh, I think there's a couple people in here. I think there are people that have been up there long enough. They're looking around and they're saying, you know what? Something ain't right. Oh, it's beautiful up here, all the pretty balloons. And we're up here going the same way around and around and around. But I think there's some of you, like what happened to me today, we started running out of propane. One time we tried to land, and I took a picture of the propane. I've been watching it the whole trip. Because <laughs> every time he went, I'd look at the needle. And I watched that thing go down. And the first time he said, uh, chased one. We're going to land over here. And we tried to land, but the winds wouldn't let us. We went up again. I chased two. We're going to land over there. And we tried again, but there were power lines. Somebody say amen. amen. We tried to go a third time. And there was another balloon in our way. But I thank God, as the propane was getting down, we found a spot to land. I believe there are people that are listening. I believe there are people in this room that are not afraid of the information, especially when the information matches the Bible that Yeshua read. Now, here's what we've provided at the Yom Teruah weekend. We provided a safe place for you to land. You've got people here that do not have an agenda other than you finding it for yourself. So I'm going to do something radical. At Shavuot, you know, they got mad at us. They said, you know what? You guys are manipulating people. You're using music, and you're using emotion, and you're using all that. And you know what? We don't think that's the Spirit of God. Let me tell you what I believe tonight. Oh, I feel it right now. Somebody feels it with me. Ain't no music. Don't need no music. Y'all don't even turn the music on. I'm not going to bring Nehemiah up and make him stand in front of you. That ain't going to happen. 
But I'm going to ask a question. Are there any Yeshua's in the house that would say this? Yehovah, Yoshi'eni. Yehovah, be the one to do it for me. Yehovah, get my place where I need to land. Yehovah, get me out of this sky. Yehovah, get me out of these winds. Yehovah, I need to be grounded in you at all costs. I'm running out of fuel. I can't do it anymore. I am ready. I'm ready. Thank you for finding a safe place. You all want to do something. I don't care about those of you that are listening. Shut off the computer if you think it's manipulation. I'm talking about the creator of the universe, that the one who I call Yeshua, when he got up from the grave, the first things out of his mouth was Yehovah. I'm going to end now. And I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to make it real, real hard. Woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Could have taken anybody up there, but let me tell you why I believe God took me up in the balloon. Not because I'm special, but because I got enough guts to tell you the truth. And you know what? He took me up there for you. Who is the person that's saying, I'm running out of fuel? Who are you? Who's the person that's saying, I need to find a safe landing spot? Who's the person that's saying, I've got to pull the red line, whatever I've got to do, I've got to be grounded in his word. I've got to know him personally. I've got to let him be who he's supposed to be in me so that when I call out his name, I'm not just being religious. I'm not going by denomination. I mean it. Yehovah, who is the person that says, I'm ready to call on you. Wherever you are, will you meet me right here? Where are you at? Come meet me right here. Who is it? Come on, hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Come on now. Quickly, ain't no music, ain't no, nah, come on, real quick. Those of you that are saying, I'm tired, I've been up there long enough, the winds of change have come, I'm tired, I'm ready to know him personally. Why did he pick Yom Teruah? To reveal his shout. Yeshua shouted it, and he meant it. Now here's the question. Do you mean it. If you mean it deep down in your heart, you're going to have to say it. Everyone else out there, would you just bow? And maybe those prayer warriors, would you get on your knees and pray for us? Because something special is happening. If you're willing, just get on your knees and pray for us right now. Father, thank you for the twist of fate. Thank you that you're maestro, and there really is no such thing. Thank you that everybody that has found this safe place to land at Yom Teruah has their hand on the red cord, and they're coming down to your earth, your grounded place where the word of God is real. Father, we give you praise. Oh, Yehovah. I want to thank you right now that you have decided to meet us apart from religious tradition, apart from theological gymnastics, apart from all of the heavy weights out there that are full of hot air. Father, thank you for your Ruach, the Holy Spirit that's right now working even amongst these that are here. Now, those that are here, I simply want you to raise your head and look past me. And I want you to imagine as you're looking past me, he gives you a peek into that place, that room of counsel. And I want you, as you're looking up, I want you to simply raise your hand and say right now, say, Father, I don't care about anybody else. I need would you, Would you take my prayer, take my prayer. Into, your heart into your heart and look down upon me? And tonight, and tonight 
show me the sparkle in your eye for me. And if I see it, I will praise you. I will glorify you. And I will worship you. Now, while you're looking up and your hands are up, can I just blow the shofar? And, and right before I blow the shofar, if you're willing, I want you simply to only copy Yeshua. According to the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. You would say these words. You'd say, Yehovah. Yehovah. No, he didn't hear you now. Yeah. You would say, Yehovah. Yehovah. Yoshi Amy. Yoshi Amy. Yehovah. Yehovah. Save me. Save me. Biblical Foundations Academy is committed to helping people around the world build a biblical foundation for their faith. Visit our website, bfainternational.com, and sign up as a free member of our academy to get instant access to hundreds of online resources and to receive our BFA bulletin. Remember, BFA International depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.